Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salawat wa salam ala rasulullah wa alihi wa sahbihi wa min wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters from all over the world, such an honor to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a very hectic ISIP day. We had an international lecture, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. And now we're having this beautiful halaqa, walking in the path of Imam Ghazali together with our beloved uh, teacher, uh, Dr. Mubarak from Singapore. I want to thank Sister Sema, the project coordinator of the Halaqa, for always leading, coordinating this Halaqa in an excellent way. And I want to thank all of our colleagues for making this happen. Thank you for joining, brothers and sisters. We're very honored to have you all with us. So essentially, uh, I'm going to uh, give over the microphone and the stage to uh, Dr. Mubarak. But before that, I just want to announce a couple of things. From next month, February, we will restart the Halaqa again with a new timing, inshallah. Uh, we will find the timing that is suitable for Dr. Mubarak because right now it's almost 12, 12 in the night for Dr. Mubarak. He lives in Singapore. So we're mindful of his health and we appreciate his generosity giving out of his precious time to us. And we will uh, announce this uh, to all of you uh, within a week or two with a new poster, a new uh, marketing material. This is the last session where we are reading the biography of Imam Ghazali. From next session, we're going to start to read the Ihya Ulumid. From A to Z, all right? So we will read it together. Uh, and uh, so start to, um, if you have access to Hiya Ulumuddin, then start to prepare yourself for the readings. We will update you guys what we will read. And uh, also access to the Hiya Ulumuddin digital version is on our Google Drive of this Halaqa, inshallah. And everything will be announced in the WhatsApp group as well. All right, without any further ado, uh, I'll give over the, uh, stage to our beloved teacher, Dr. Mubarak. An honor to have you with us, brother. Please go ahead. Bismillah. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Amin. 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 ما شاء الله كان ما لم يشاء لم يكن إلهي أنت مقصودي ورضاك مطلوب عاصني محبتك ومعرفتك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. Let us begin by reciting our intention. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. We read the Fatiha with the intention to give and to receive benefits, to teach and to learn, to follow the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم ظاهر النظن. And with the intention to cooperate, work together, and assist one another in Islam, and in adhering to the Sharia of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, may Allah grant us complete determination and diligence in seeking beneficial knowledge, able to perform good deeds with sincerity and longevity in obedience to Him, a good ending during the time of death. Al Fatiha bin Niyat al Nafi wa Tifaq wa Taalum wa Taalim wa Al-Aqida bin Nabi al Mukhtar fi Sir wa Al Ijhar wa bin Niyat al Tanasuri wa Taawni wa Taadun al Din. وإقامة شريعة لسيد المرسلين وأن الله يرغب للنشاط والحمى والجد والاجتهاد في طلب العلوم النافعة وعمل بها من الإخلاص والطول العمر في طاعة الله وحسن الخاتمة عند الموت وإلى حضرة النبي سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين يتناول ويأتي المستعين هذا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم والضالين الحمد لله الحمد لله الحمد لله شكر الله شكر لرسول الله في استوفيق أن يسناه الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى still given us إيمان and still given us health in this sacred month of Rajab for us to be able to increase our devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to come close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our preparation to meet the month of Ramadan, insha'Allah, that is coming in less than two months. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to give us health, continue to give us patience and perseverance, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts all our ibadah, all our sadaqah, all our dua, insha'Allah. Ameen. All right, for today's session, the last session, the last session that we had was in November. So November, December, Jan, December, so with two months, right, into the, uh, that, that, uh, then we had, we meet again. Uh, in November, we, 
talk about chapter number three, which is the uh, exposition of uh, Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali on the reality of prophethood, on the nature of prophethood, on nubuwa, yeah, on nubuwa, and the urgent need all people have for it. Now we did not have a discussion on that, right? Because usually what we do is we will all right discuss the previous lessons. And then after that, we read all right, the current lesson. And then the ideas in the current lesson is something that we discuss in the upcoming lessons. So for today, inshallah, we will relook at chapter number three in terms of the key ideas and how this is related all right, to the whole conception that we have put Munkis Minat Dalala in helping us to understand youth psychology. Okay? And then after that, we will proceed on to read the final chapter, which is chapter number four, the reason for disseminating knowledge after turning away for therefore, uh, the last chapter of Munkis from page 47 onwards. So, on the topic on the nature of the prophethood, what are the main ideas that uh, Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali? Well, you all are seeing my slides, right? Yes, yes, brother. Please go ahead, doctor. Okay, all right. So, on the idea of the nature of prophethood, we see that Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali. All right, there are a couple of points. Number one is his defense on the epistemic role of prophetic revelation in providing certainty on matters outside the scope of reason. So this is what he was trying to establish because within the passage, Imam Muhammad Al-Ghazali on, on, on page uh, between 41 to 43, all right, he mentioned down there that there were groups of people all right, on page number 42, the third paragraph, if presented with the concepts of the intellect, the discerning individual would reject them and dismiss them. Some of the intellectuals have likewise rejected and dismissed the concepts of prophethood. That is sheer ignorance since it can only explain by the fact that such an intellectual has not reached the stage of discernment and it does not exist where it is concerned, so he supposes that it does not exist in itself. So there were, all right, here is also in relationship all right, to the previous chapter where Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali was talking about the different group of seekers of truth. Right, the different groups of the seekers of truth and the methodology of these respective seekers of truth all right, were uh, using in order for them to reach into certainty. Now in his defense on the epistemic role of prophetic revelation, which is what he Right, in providing certainty yakin on matters outside the scope, right, he presented this rationale. He, did, he presented this need of, of prophethood through a thorough, uh, logical, step-by-step -step rational evidence on the possibility of the existence of prophethood. So we go to page number 41, page number 42, and page number 43. He moves right from the whole idea of the senses, all right, how the senses are developed in each respective stage to the point when the intellect is being given as it progresses, right, as we grow up, right, to the point where, all right, the, the, the higher cognitive faculties are also given to all of us. So, and then that is where, all right, he mentioned that establish the fact that if you have not experienced something, does not mean that it is not in existence. Right? So this is very important because there he mentions, suppose that a blind person right, from birth did not know the spectrum of colors and the interrelationship of form and he was told about that at an early stage. He would find it incomprehensible and would not accept it. Right? Meaning that if we have not experienced something, we do not experience that stage of prophethood, all right, or receiving wahyu does not indicate that wahyu does not exist. Right? Then dream has an analogy to the nature of prophethood. All right? So Allah the exalted has brought that home to his creatures on page 42 by providing them with a model presenting the peculiar nature of prophethood. That model is the dream. Since the dreamer perceives what is in the unseen, either explicitly or in the guise of a parable to be interpreted. Right? Now, certainty of prophethood must be established through rational arguments, 
not just by believing on the events of a miracle. Here, this is something which is very unique on the approach of Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali in this, in this chapter. If we turn to page number 45, all right, the second last paragraph where he says, you will have to resolve the question posed by miracles, not a desert. If your faith is based on a statement designed to present the miracle as evidence, your faith will be shattered by a statement designed to cast doubt and suspicion. Supernatural event must therefore constitute only one ingredient among the proofs and the indication in your overall view so that you may acquire a necessary knowledge which you cannot possibly attribute to a specific piece of evidence. So here the nature of prophethood that he was explaining, defending the epistemic role of prophetic revelation vis-a-vis -vis the use of the akal, vis-a-vis eh, -vis the use of the akal, is established eh, not only through revelation or through miracles, but using rational argument. Why we require prophethood. Why prophets are necessary for all human beings in order for us to be able right, to carry out our, our life in accordance to the divine shah. And so that's the first uh, point. That the first main point that he was establishing in the uh, nature of the prophethood. The next, this part here comes immediately after his explanation on the methods of the Sufis. So if we go to our text again, and then we read at the last part, right, of chapter number 2 of page 39, right, he mentions down there, one thing that became absolutely clear to me from pursuing the spiritual path of the Sufis was the reality of prophethood and its special quality. So why does this come immediately after, all right, the Sufis, okay? So here, he was making room for the epistemic value of mystical cognition, ma'arifa, divine inspiration, ilham, and spiritual unveiling, kachak, in providing certainty in areas inaccessible to philosophical inquiry. Right? So on page number 43, right, uh, the last paragraph, as for the peculiarities of prophethood that extend beyond this, they are perceptible only by the state of experience derived from following the path of Sufism. So in a way, it's making room for religious and moral praxis, which is the key to spiritual knowledge because the quest for higher levels of certitude is linked all right, to the moral life in Islam is linked to how we practice Islam, how we carry out the divine commandments as how it is been exhibited, uh, that's how it is been modeled by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, modeled by the Sahaba, right, the Salafu Salih, right, and also the pious predecessors. Right? So, it comes immediately after, right, Sufism, right, in a way that the idea of revelation all right, so you see on top, I mentioned it as prophetic revelation, which is wahyu in its technical sense. All right, the second part is wahyu in a more general sense. All right? Wahyu in a more general sense. Now, as an Ashara theologian, this chapter, all right, this, cha this chapter uh, demonstrates the battle of Imam Abu al Abu Hamid al Ghazali on two polemical areas. Number one is with the Ismailis Balthanites, where al Ghazali defends the place of reason. So, if we remember in chapter number two, when he was explaining the methodology of the Talims, right? Because they are only to him, the seekers of truth belong to four groups, right? Number one, the, 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 the theologians, the philosophers. Right, the Talims, the Talimites, the Balthanites, and then the Sufis. Right? So when he was talking about the Balthanites, right, he was defending the place of reason. Because for them, right, uh, reason has no place. Right? Reason has no place. 
it is always a record on course to the Imam of Maksum, yeah, where his works, Imam Al Ghazali's work in defending the place of reason, all right, in his dialogue, uh, in his uh, attempt, all right, to show that there is a place, all right, for reason and knowledge that is established by reason has its authenticity and certainty. And on the other spectrum, where he is with the peripatetic philosophers, where Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali defends the place of revelation, where reason needs to be put in its correct place. Not that reason is able to achieve the highest level of certainty in even the metaphysical areas, especially within all right, the doctrines of the philosophers, the peripatetic philosophers, Right, especially three of the doctrines, right, in Tahafud al Falasifa, where Imam Muhammad al Ghazali, right, totally, right, dismissed them, right, which is the eternity of the world, right, the non bodily resurrection, and also that God only knows particulars, that God only knows universal, but not the particulars. So, the, the, the methodology of the philosophers that put reason. Uh, that's put the akal, the intellect, has the source of knowledge, right? Without a recourse to revelation. So in this, in this part of the book, right, he brings, right, he he as a person who is, uh, who manifests wasatiya, uh, who manifests wasatiya, who's mystically, right, he sought to establish a not sour, to establish a balanced and holistic epistemology true to the holistic constituents of the human beings where senses, akal, and kal are reliable sources of knowledge. So here we see how Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali right, uh, within his right, within this uh, is placing that various constitutions of the human being right, the, the senses, the akal, and the heart in its right place. Yeah, in its right place. And this is what all right, we also need uh, to, to think about. So now, how this is in his Al-Atasat, Al-Atasat, he said, how could right guidance be attained by one who is content with conforming to a tradition and a testimony and rejects the methods of investigation and theorization? Does he not know that there is no basis for the divine teaching other than the statements of the master of mankind, and that its truthfulness is what in what he relates is established by a demonstration of the intellect. So this he was targeting and referring right to the Ismailis, to the Talimans, right, who does not acknowledge the uncle to be a source of knowledge. Right? Every time is you have to recourse it to the Imam al maqsum the second statement, and how could one be guided to what is right if he confines himself to pure reason and does not illuminate his eyesight with the light of revelation? And here he is referring to the methods of the peripatetic philosophers, right? where even in the matters of metaphysics, they recourse right, the argument to akal right, by not looking into what revelation has mentioned. So this is all right. In a nutshell, what chapter three is all about. Now, bringing this back, all right, to the model of the the the, the Al Ghazali's model of the human constitution, and then tying it back to what we have been discussing, all right, for almost all right a year, on theorization about youth psychology, is knowing that at the youthful stage is where the intellectual faculty is developing. How have we engaged our youth intellectually in matters pertaining to religious doctrine? Because here in this chapter, the doctrine on the nature of prophethood, right? something which is for us, we always recourse it to revelation, but Imam Al-Ghazali presented this all right, in a very logical manner. So the presentation of a doctrine all right, in step-by-step -step way that is logical and easy to follow, that will help someone to recognize that this is possible. 
there is a place for the heart. There is a place for revelation all right, within the whole epistemology all right, of Islam. Now, in order to do that, have we equipped ourselves with the necessary knowledge and tools to be able to engage and meet youths at their respective developmental stages? And we know that youth have different, different stages uh, of their development. Now, what are the social structures, educational institutions that are present within our cultural spaces to provide this needed support? So, so far, when we have read Mukis bin Dalal, Imam Al Ghazali starts right, during his teen years. Right? He, he starts his whole intellectual journey and explains to us during his teen years where he had the epistemological crisis. That crisis where where do you put the senses, where do you put akal, where do you put the heart? At that point of time, it is the struggle to be able to recognize that there is a higher cognitive faculty than the akal. Right? And then moving all right, from that stage, even to chapter number three, where he's talking about the necessity of prophethood, presenting that doctrine. Uh, presenting that doctrine in a very logical manner. Uh, so uh, we pause for a while here. All right, you see any reflections uh, from anyone? Over. Brothers and sisters, feel free to come with any reflections with regards to the slides that Dr. Mubarak has presented so far. And we're we're just a, we're we're such a small group, so you guys can unmute yourself. You don't need to write it in the chat. Just raise your digital hand, and we'll allow you to unmute yourself, dear brothers and sisters. And honor to have you with us. So the first question is: How have we engaged our youths intellectually in matters pertaining to religious doctrines? That's a really good question. Any inputs from anyone? Have we equipped ourselves with the necessary knowledge and tools to be able to engage and meet youths at their respected developmental stages? What are the social structures, educational institutions that are present within our culture space to provide the needed support? So maybe I'll ask you a question, Dr. Mubarak. Um, yeah. Your experience working in Singapore and in the Nusantara region, would you say that you guys have the proper educational institutions to offer this type of space uh, that gives a support? And is it a support that the youth can relate to in this modern era? How is the pedagog pedagogical input? You work as a school. Uh, I, I know you're a school teacher. Uh, forgot, uh, please, forgive me, doc, please forgive me, Dr. Mubarak. I thought I forgot your role in the school you work with. But nevertheless, you have a lot of experience on working in schools as well. Well, if you ask, all right, do we have the actual space? Are we actively engaging and trying? Definitely, we are trying. Uh, the respective stakeholders are trying. But uh, is it enough? Are we doing enough? I don't think we are. Uh, um, more of uh, politics and uh, uh, wanting to be uh, among, among, among the political leaders and other community leaders right, of not putting the needs of the youth uh, as their central uh, as the central was his concern, but more about what is being projected becomes more of their concern. So yeah. that in itself um, reduces uh, the value addedness of the programs. But definitely, you have a lot of uh, there are there are our most majority of our most right uh, in 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 Singapore. Uh, we have youth wings. Uh, mm -hmm. We have youth wings, and these youth wings are doing uh, excellent social and welfare activities right, within the community. But how about intellectual and spiritual activities? That is something that is still lacking um, uh, within our structure, within our structure, because most has been looked upon or transformed into more of a social and welfare entity, right? Instead of 
um, well, intellectual and spiritual. Of course, your normal daily prayers are there, but we need more than that for the youths. Uh, we need more than that for the youth. So that's that's our our situation here in Singapore. It's not perfect. Uh, it's not perfect. Um, but Alhamdulillah, during this, we are trying our very best. And during this period of um, Palestinian and uh, and Israel conflict, we do carry out safe spaces for our youth, for them to help them to process, all right, what is currently happening, all right, to provide them the intellectual and the spiritual and emotional support, all right. So there okay. are attempts. That's great. That's great to hear. I think that, partially, what I think lacks. And not only in Islamic education, but generally education in this modern era is an holistic approach, which essentially this table that you're showcasing in this slide, you know, deals with like if our human constitution, according to Imam Ghazali, rahimullah, constitutes of our body, our heart, our intellect, reason, soul and spirit. How do we create a curriculum that actually involves all of these five components? I think our in curriculums and uh, education and specific, even in Islamic education, it's not holistic. It's very much either aqlani, and it's not aqlani in the way that I actually think should be. It's using the lower level of the aql, not the higher level of the aql, because the higher level of the aql is emotional intelligence and spiritual intelligence. The lower level is just feed the knowledge in and just recite it, which is great, but not understanding it. So it's almost like you're learning a theory without know how to apply it or working with the practice of it. So it's theory without application or theory without practices. It's not an embodiment of the knowledge. It's just knowledge. And that will not be a benefit in there because that will just be something that you know without knowing how to apply it. Hmm. Or it only addresses, let's say, your body without connecting the theory. And the qalb and the nafs and the ruh is uh, it's just theoretical framework unfortunately in many ways so i think that what we need to do is to bring about a curriculum which is holistic which integrates these aspects and and that we see the connection between them i think a lot of youths for instance that have neurodiversity whether they're on the adhd spectra or asperger or autism uh, they are mashallah gifted with so many tools mm. uh, where they can be super intelligent beyond the means of what we as non never divergent might be the problem is that our theater our, our 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 curricula is according to the norm and not the abnormal so essentially uh, uh, for a lot of uh, young boys who, are, who have adhd if we start the education through the jess they will easily connect it to the apple so for instance there is a brother a friend of mine mm -hmm. he's a grappler he works with grappling he hmm. starts by grappling, then he uses the grappling to speak about the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for instance, or the seerah of the Prophet. Hmm. So I think that for all of our participants here, looking at the Imam Ghazali's model of the human constitution, we could definitely learn how to integrate it, but don't see this as you know, isolated islands, rather that these are all interconnected and heavily dependent on one another. So yeah, I think that's part of my reflections. And also to bring in uh, when it comes to speaking about education, that we also see Islam as an expression of the primordial, you know, fitra, you know, uh, that we all possess, you know, and that the whole education process is to take us through a, a level, to the journal through different levels of uh, consciousness and expressions that could lead us to transformation of both ourself, but also our communities, so that knowledge, inquiry, and studies should be transformative. Like when you and I studied at CMC, it was transformative, right? Yeah. Because it was a holistic. But if you don't transform in the education, it doesn't mean that the knowledge is not you know, useful, but it wouldn't elevate you into a higher, uh, you know, ahwal or, you know, emotional state or maqam or spiritual state. Allah. Excellent, excellent. So for it to be transformation, the transformation of the soul, uh, the, the whole idea of character education um, should not be a topic on its own, but character education is something which is the responsibility of every single subject matter. How does every single subject matter 
is able to contribute to the transformation of the soul. Yeah, exactly. MashaAllah. Mm. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Muhammad, we have Sister Seda who's raising her hand. Let's allow okay, her to speak. Yes. Seda, go ahead. Go ahead. You can unmute yourself, yeah. Sister Seda. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. <clears throat> Sorry, Brother Jamal, you're not feeling that great with cold, but you, just wanted to share, alhamdulillah, uh, Dr. Mubarak, this uh, off and on uh, listening to and also the recordings of the lectures is really uh, great. So, jazakallah uh, khair for uh, offering the Al-Ghazali series to us. Um, I think I'm, I'm in an education leadership doctorate program here in the U.S., and it hurts me to know this whole side of intellectual excellence, Al Ghazali's um, treatises, you know, deliverance from error, and looking at the virtues and looking at the self reflection from a um, self correction perspective is missed because American educational system or European educational systems are based on performance and not necessarily effort. Mm. Um, and then like Brother Jamaluddin said, the normative aspect of it is um, front and center and the outliers and the exceptionality is almost considered abnormal. Mm. And hence the overdiagnosis of everybody with learning disabilities, whereas, you know, it could just be that the learning styles of the child or like we appraised earlier, the developmental differences between children mm. uh, are there. And hence, that's the beauty of everybody being um, individual in their access to their higher mental faculties. Mm. So when I look at even from Islamic psychology perspective, the TIIP model, um, in counseling and counseling youth and children. But here, I'm as I'm learning more about Ghazali, I'm using it in my therapeutic interactions with youth. Mm -hmm. And I think that we cannot, um, we, we can scopically focus on one of the aspects like the body, the heart, the intellect, the soul, the ruh, but not at the expense of the other four mm -hmm. being ignored. So what is the spirit of education in this context? What you mentioned earlier with Palestine under attack as Muslim youth, how can they go inward and think regardless of whatever the leaders in the Muslim worlds are uh, not able to do for one reason or another and whatever the rest of the world is uh, doing in terms of its lack of uh, spiritual empathy for fellow human beings? children, animals, the land, uh, the sanctity of the worship places in uh, uh, Gaza, um, without residing to, uh, resorting to destruction or mm. weapons, mm. what can we do intellectually and spiritually, like you pointed out, that we lack there? Mm. It's one thing to read Quran and memorize it and Alhamdulillah understand it even, but it's another thing to live in a world where um, prayers alone and uh, saying Alhamdulillah and Allah Akbar alone is not going to. Even Allah says in Quran that I'm not going to change your situation until you change what is within you. Mm. So I would really love that sisters and brothers, young youth, Muslim youth, and also I extend it to non-Muslim youth, that Al-Ghazali's beautiful uh, reflections on human psyche and human existence mm. in the context of spiritual paradigm mm. is easily relatable. Mm. And Alhamdulillah, with these questions that you put here on this slide, you are doing it exactly, at least for this gathering here and whoever will benefit from it, inshallah. Yes. So Jazakallah khair. I'll be thinking about these questions deeply, maybe even as part of my dissertation. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much, sister. May Allah provide ease in your dissertation, inshallah. Sister so, Sarah, one of our great colleagues, uh, Dr. Mubarak, always active in ISIT, mashallah. Thank you, mashallah. So knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, sister, for great inputs. And 
maybe what we can do from this um actually brother Mubarak, i changed my mind we need to read the finalize the monk with you in all honesty <laughs> just because there is so again, much again. let's finalize now i was thinking we should start next week with next month with the uh, yeah let's let's finalize all the chapters first i mean we are 20 people here so let's all of us can benefit from, and then we'll start with Ihya, because we need to understand what shaped Imam Ghazali's view. And I think to read the Munqif uh, is important, actually. Yeah. It's like reading Malcolm's biography just to understand Malcolm as a person. You know? So I think yeah. it's definitely... So let's continue. Shall we? we can still discuss the timing, though. It's too late for you, but that's the different yeah. thing. <laughs> I think it's uh, very great, because what you're doing is you're... you're distilling the book uh, in a way that we can all benefit in our in our works, like Sister Sayyid, I refer to her dissertation. So I think that would be great. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should do a vote. I think most people here would love to finalize. Right, brothers and sisters, if you want to finalize the biography, please write the yes in the chat. We'll <laughs> do it like a joint uh, voting. Write the yes in the chat. <laughs> or no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll continue, inshallah. All right, uh, brother Mubarak, uh, Dr. Mubarak, please go ahead with the uh, rest. Okay, inshallah. So now we will, we will move on to read. All right, the chapter number four. Let me just uh, share the screen for you. Chapter number four. <clears throat> right, are you seeing the chapter number four? Yeah, yeah, we we'll see it. Do you want somebody to read for you, uh, Dr. Mubarak? Yes, we have someone who wants to volunteer to read. Right, I'll. I yeah, just asked someone in the chat. Yeah. People are people are very humble here. So I will ask randomly now. Let's see here. We have Sister Fatima Mirza. Please, if you could read. Could you read, Sister Fatima? I can read it. Okay, Sister Sarah, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Inshallah. Uh, so this is the scroll. You need to scroll for you down. Or you have the text on your own? Uh, no, I can see it. I can see it. I think we can make it. Uh, no, I can move it actually on my screen. Alhamdulillah. Okay. No, that's okay, Sister Fatma. Okay. Uh, or <clears throat> so the reason of disseminating knowledge after turning away therefrom. Then when I had devoted myself to seclusion and private <clears throat> retreat for nearly 10 years, several things became absolutely clear to me for reasons too many of me to count, sometimes through experience, sometimes through scientific proof, and sometimes through <clears throat> acceptance based on faith. I realized that the human being is a creature consisting of a body and a heart. By the heart, I mean the reality of the spirit, which is the location of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not the flesh and blood that are shared by the corpse and the beast. I realized that the physical body has a state of good health in which its welfare resides and a state of sickness in which its destruction resides. I realized that the heart likewise has a state of good health and soundness and that no one is saved. Then he says the ayah in Quran, إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهِ بِكَلْبٍ salim, Except one who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a whole heart and that it has a state of sickness in which its eternal uh, otherworldly destruction resides as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exalted has said in the Quran that <clears throat> in their hearts is a desire fi uh, maradun and then <clears throat> he says I reside, uh, sorry, I realize the ignorance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a deadly poison, that the cause of the heart sickness is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by following passionate desire, that intimate knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is its life restoring antidote. <clears throat> and that obedience to Him in opposition to passionate desire is its. A healing remedy. I realize that there is uh, no means of curing it by removing the, its sickness and gaining its good health except with certain medicines just as there is no other means of curing the physical body. The remedies of the physical body are effective in acquiring good health by means of a spiritual property 
they contain, um, special property they contain, and the intellectual cannot ascertain them by means of the mind. They must follow the physicians who deceived them from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who were um, cognizant of the peculiarities of things through the peculiar character of prophethood. It likewise became clear to me necessarily that the remedies of the acts of worship with its specifications and its prescribed quantities were received from the prophets. <clears throat> Their effectiveness cannot be ascertained by means of the intelligence of the intellectuals, but only by following the examples of the prophets who perceived those special properties of the light of prophethood, not by, not by means of the mind. The medical remedies are prepared by blending various ingredients, some of which are multiples of others in weights and quantity. So their quantitative difference involves a secret factor relating to their peculiar properties. The same applies to acts of worship, which are the remedies of the sickness of hearts, for they are composed of actions that vary in kind and quantity. The act of prostration, sujood, is performed <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, the act of prostration sujood is performed twice as often as the act of bowing, ruku, and the da dawn prayer consists of half as many cycles as the afternoon prayers. These differences involve a secret factor relating to their peculiar properties, which can only be recognized by the light of prophethood. Great indeed is the stupidity and ignorance of someone who seeks to discover an underlying reason for them by means of the mind, or supposes that they result from conventional agreement, nor <clears throat> from a divine secret which prescribes them uh, which prescribes them on the basis of peculiarity. Physical remedies have roots that form their basis, elements and supplements that constitute their factors of completion. Each one of them having a peculiar, particular influence on the actions of their roots. And, uh, super regu uh, regulatory and customary <clears throat> practices are likewise effective in perfecting the results of the basic elements of the acts of worship. Yeah, so in short, the prophets are the physicians of the sicknesses of hearts. The functioning of the mind is usually, usually, sorry, is, use, is useful only if it makes an, us recognize the fact, if it confirms the truth of prophethood and admits its own inability to perceive what can only mm, be perceived by the eye of the prophethood, and if it takes us by the hand and commits us to prophethood as the blind are committed to to the guides, and as the bewildered um, invalids are committed to the sympathetic, sympathetic physicians. This is the proper course and function of the mind, and it has no further role to play except in understanding what the physician sets before it. These are matters that we came to understand as the inevitable consequence of witnessing during the time spent in private retreat and seclusion. Right. We then... Yeah. Thank you. Now, from, from, from what we have read, there are two very important points that Imam Ghazali is making. Right? It is a continuation of the nature of prophethood. All right? And from that, all right, uh, this observation on how people are relating and understanding what it means by witness of the second part of the Shahada. Right? When we are witnessing uh, the messengerhood, the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What is that implication in our life and our thoughts? Right? So two points here that he makes it very clear is that, uh, firstly, right, the intellect recognition of its own epistemic limitation, and thus the necessity to resort to prophetic revelation. So here, the we read that it is the proper function of the mind. And he has no further role to play except in understanding what the physician sets before. Okay? Trying to, the mind trying to think about 
what is the secrets between in the two cycles of prayer in Subo and why Zohor is for is a not necessary thing because that comes from the light of Prophet. So therefore the mind all right, knows that the sickness of the heart, the only recourse for the sickness of the heart is to submit to the knowledge of Prophet. All right, to, to submit all right, to what Prophet has told us to do. Mean to submit to revelation. So the uncle recognizes that. Right? The uncle recognizes that this limitation is own epistemic limitation. And then secondly, is that the prophetic revelation has divine guard to spiritual guidance and ethical cultivation. We want to move on all right, in our life all right, in an ethical manner. We cannot but follow prophetic revelation. And that prophetic revelation is through the praxis of religion, the praxis of Islam. It is through the amal that we are supposed to carry out, which leads us to Ahya Alumuddin. Because Ahya Alumuddin is the, uh, this um, deals with the signs, the mu'amala, the ilmul mu'amala. Okay? So it's categorized as the ilm tariqul ahra, the signs on the path to hereafter where Imam Ghazali divides it into two, which is Almul Mu'amala and Almul Mukashafa. But Ahya Ulumuddin deals with Almul Mu'amala, the how on how you move, or the how on how you carry out your life so that you submit yourself to that prophetic revelation. So, wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah is a cause, is a, is a statement that makes us to be able to submit a statement of an abbot, a statement of a servant who acknowledges that God has chosen someone to be the one that is going to guide us. And us submitting to an authority requires us right, to step on our egos, right, to bring humility into our hearts. And in order to do that, right, that vanguard of spiritual guidance comes from the light of prophet. So that idea of Nubuwa, right, that Imam Ghazali continues from right, the previous chapter to this point, right, points to those to those to these two things. Right? Points to these two things. Okay. <clears throat> uh, uh, Dr. Mubarak, would you like somebody else to read? Yeah, can. Yeah. So anybody who feels and anybody who, who, who would like to read, uh, the, the participants, feel free to reach. Or else I just ask one of you. I could read again, inshallah. That's okay. Brother Shabbat. Shabbat. Permission to say that. Allow me to yeah. try to bring in somebody else. Oh, yeah, sure. Can... Please. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah, inshallah. Your reading is excellent. We have uh, Sister Yusra. Okay, Hanan. Please go ahead, Sister Hanan. By the way, thank you, Sister Sarah. Your reading is excellent. We're very honored to have you with us. Sister Hanan, please, you're, you're, you 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 raised your digital hand. You, please unmute yourself. You have a question to ask or reflection or you would like to read? Yeah. All right. Maybe she has some difficulties in unmuting. So I'm going to ask somebody randomly now. So Sister Yusra, would you like to read? Yeah, sure. Um, one moment. Uh, so from the first paragraph, we then observed. Yes, sir. Yeah, we then observed the inadequacy, the inadequacy of the doctrines concerning the essence of prophethood, then those concerning the reality of prophethood, then those concerning the practical application of what prophethood has elucidated. We examined the ramifications of that among the people. So we observed the causes, the causes of their uh, laxity and the weakness of their faith and found those causes to be four in number. One, a cause uh, attributable to those engrossed in the science of philosophy. Two, a cause attributable to those engrossed in the methods of Sufism. Three, a cause attributable to those associated with the claim to provide teaching. 
Number four, a cause attributable to the conduct of those stamped with a reputation for knowledge amongst the people. Mm. I therefore devoted a period of time to tracking individual people. I questioned someone who was falling short in compliance with the sacred law, asking him about the about his ambiguity and probing his belief and his conscience. I said to him, how can you account for this shortcoming of yours? If you believe in the hereafter, but you do not prepare for it, and you sell it for the price of this world, this is sheer stupidity. You would not sell two articles for the same price of one. So how can you sell that which has no end for the price of days that are numbered? If you do not believe, you are an infidel. So exert yourself in the quest for faith. You must examine the cause of your hidden unbelief, which is your doctrine inwardly and which is the cause of your insolence outwardly, even if you do not declare it explicitly. Preferring to adorn yourself with this appearance of faith and gain respects by paying lip service to the sacred law. Someone must say, if this were a matter requiring serious attention, the scholars would be more, most deserving of such such attention. So-and-so is one of the celebrities amongst the, amongst the erudite, but he does not perform the ritual prayer. So-and-so drinks alcoholic liquor. So-and-so consumes the properties of the religious endowments and the properties of the orphans. So-and-so consumes the bounty of the ruler without being on guard against that which is unlawful. So-and-so accepts bribes when giving judgment and testimony. The list of such examples goes on and on. A second speaker may claim knowledge of Sufism and maintain that he has uh, that he has reached a stage of progress beyond the need for worship. A third speaker may offer some other pretext from the ambiguities of the advocates of libertin libertinism. They, these are the ones who have strayed from Sufism. A fourth speaker has met the professors of, of academic teaching, so he may say, the truth is problematic, the way to it is blocked, and the disagreement about it is considerable. Some of the schools of thought are superior to others, and the intellectual proofs are mutually conflicting. No reliance can be placed, therefore, on the dogma of the dogmatists. The person who claims to provide teaching is an arbitrary judge who has no proof. So how can I substitute certainty for doubt? A, first, a fifth speaker must say, my understanding of this is not based on adherence to convention. I've studied the science of philosophy. I have grasped the reality of prophethood, recognizing that it is that, that it's content, uh, that it's content, relates to wisdom wisdom and welfare and that the prof the purpose of its worshipful fighting and quarreling with one another and giving free rein to their lustful appetites. I am not one of the ignorant masses needing to be subjected to formal constraint. I am one of the wise. I follow wisdom, I am proficient in it, and because of it I am independent of adherence to convention. This is the fullest extent of the faith of someone who studies the philosophy of the abstract theologians and learns that from the books of Ibn Sina and Abu Nasr al-Farabi, uh, these are the ones who adorn themselves with the superficial appearance of Islam. You may sometimes see one of them reading the Quran, attending the congregation and the ritual prayers and, extol and, and extolling the sacred law with his tongue. In spite of that, however, he does not abstain from drinking alcohol, liquor, and various kinds of indecent and immoral behavior. Suppose someone asked him, if, prophet, if prophethood is not authentic, why do you perform the ritual prayer? His response to this may be, for the sake of physical wealth, uh, 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 sorry, for the, for the sake of physical wealth, well, where it lost my spot. For the sake of um, 
Oh, yes, for the sake of physical exercise in keeping with the local custom and for the protection of wealth and children. Perhaps he will say the sacred law is authentic and prophethood is true. So he will be asked, well then, why do you drink al alcoholic liquor? His reply will be alcoholic liquor was forbidden only because it gives rise to enmity and hatred, but I in my wisdom am on, am on guard against that. I drink for the purpose of sharpening my wits. In a testament of his, Ibn Sina actually wrote that he had made certain solemn promises to Allah. He he vowed that he would honour the rules of the sacred law and that he would not fall short in for amusement, but only for medicinal and healing purposes. With, uh, with regard to the purity of faith and adherence to the acts of worship, his condition thus extended to the point of ex excerpting alcoholic liquor from prohibition for the purpose of healing. Such is the faith of those amongst, among, among them who lay claim to faith. Some have been deluded by them, and their decision has weakened the rebuttal of those who rebut them, since they have gone so far as to repudiate the uh, repudiate the scenes of geometry and logic. Um, uh, just... As well as other sciences. Uh, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as other sciences that are actually necessary for them for reasons that we have previously explained. When I saw that the faith of certain classes had weakened to this extent for these reasons, and I saw myself firmly committed to disclosing the ambiguity to the point where where exposing these people was easier for me than drinking water because of my frequent plunging into the sciences and their methods, I mean the methods of the Sufis, the philosophers, the academics and the outstanding scholars. It struck me that the time for discharging that particular task had been appointed by destiny. Mm -hmm. I asked myself, what benefits do we, do you derive from private retreat and seclusion when the disease is general? Uh, the physicians are sick and your fellow creatures are on the verge of perdition. Then I said to myself, when will you devote yourself to relieving this distress and dispelling this darkness. For the time is the, is the time of laxity and the age is the age of falsehood. If you, if you emerge in summoning people from their methods to the truth, the people of the time would be unanimous um, in, the, in their general hostility towards you. How will you resist them and how will you live together f with them? How can that be accomplished except as a, at a favourable time and with the support of a pious and irresistible uh, ruler? All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. So this part here, all right, Imam al uh, we can see that the reason of of him, all right, going back into teaching, right? Uh, number one, all right, of the whole idea of prophethood, reasons and all that. Also on the next is a more serious um things that was happening and mind us that this is written okay uh in the early uh 12th century and we know that was the century of how called the golden age of Islam and and, and uh, many things that we always nostalgically wants to go back who was there and talked about it. Uh, but that is, this is the situation. The situation that he saw in Baghdad. Uh, the situation that he saw in Baghdad and the other parts of the Muslim world about all the... It's not about the common people, but it is about uh, right, the laxity and the weakness of their faith and found those causes to be four in number. Uh, right? Why people are having weakness of faith is because philosophers, those people engaged in philosophy, 
those who are engrossed in Sufism, those who are teaching the religion, and those who has attained a so-called high status among the people due to their knowledge, they themselves are not practicing the religion itself. That was the situation at the time of Imam Abu Hamid al -Zay. right? That, that drives him to want to go back right, into teaching after he has left teaching. Okay? After he has left teaching. Here, what does he mean by he left teaching for 10 years? We know that Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali, right, two years after leaving uh, Nizamiyah, two years after leaving Nizamiyah, that is where he came back. Right? He came back to his family right, due to whatever reason that was, was, was needed. Uh, whatever reason that was needed. So, therefore, why that number 10 years? And does it mean that when he came back from his retreat, he was not teaching? All right? and, and this teaching is referring to what? Right? So here he is referring to teaching in terms of teaching in the established educational institutions that were in the Islamic uh, learning centers. Knowing that who was he before he left for Baghdad in his class, all right, you have hundreds of people attending his lessons. Uh, he has that kind of crowd right, that he has. So upon returning after two years, he still continued teaching, but his classes were smaller in his Zawiyah. In his Zawiyah. Now he's going in back into teaching in the public domain in an in educational institution where he was invited by right, uh, the, the son of the, uh, the vizier all right, who was his patron when he was in Baghdad, the son of uh, uh, Allah I forgot his name. Uh, oh, the Mamluk, uh, the Mamluk uh, vizier. He, he, sorry, he slips my mind. All right, his son. All right, call Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali back. All right, to teach. All right, back to teach in Nishapur. Yeah, back to teach in Nishapur. So that is what he means by going back to teaching. Yeah? In going back to teaching, taking a formal role in an educational institution all right, in order to spread the knowledge of the religion. And this was the reason that what he saw was happening. And not that he is hearing just this word. He even he says, I therefore devoted a period of time to tracking individual people. These individual people that is coming from these four categories. And he met and he asked all right, those questions to check on okay, that situation of the Ummah. So the backbone to me, the, the soul of the Ummah, right, the soul of the Ummah lies on right, the health of the Ulama and the Umarok and how the Ulama and the Umarok are working together. Right? If these three components right, are unhealthy, therefore the ummah will be unhealthy. That's where the soul, our individual soul is our heart. But the soul of the ummah right, is on the ulama, the umara, and how they are carrying out their respective roles and working together. Right? Working together. There's quite a, a number of pages left. Right? So, Brother Jamaluddin, uh, you say that the next session we still continue. Yeah, let's let's continue the readings. It seems like people want that, and we're a good group of people here. Okay. I think that um, I just wanted to. I shared what libertinism means in the chat. There are some words that might be might be new. So libertinism means uh, having a lifestyle or a pattern of behavior characterized by self indulgence. So when Imam Ghazali criticized. Those who he was referring to Ibn Sina and uh, Al Farabi, he used uh, they translated the word to libertinism. Um, yes, let's let's end for now. I'm also mindful of your time, Dr. Mubarak. It's very late for you, so I think uh, we will continue the readings next time. Um, we will uh, we will get back to you guys when the timing. Maybe we will keep this timing for now. We'll see. I need, we speak. I will speak with Dr. Mubarak and Sister Sema. And then when we start the Ihiya, we might change the timings. Uh, inshallah, we will speak with Dr. Mubarak. Uh, his time is very important. 
Um, and we will announce which pages you guys could read to next session, inshallah. So you guys can prepare yourself. Uh, any final remarks from you, Dr. Mubarak? Any nasiha for our participants today? Inshallah. Yeah. Uh, let's continue with our dua right, for our brothers and sisters in Palestine. Right? Inshallah. Right? Change whatever that and the wisdom behind what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for this, right, to make it visible for us, right, and to reward them with all the struggles that they have gone through. Ameen, ameen, ameen. Barakallahu feekum. That's a really important reminder. Uh, so we have how many chapters left uh, reading, uh, Dr. Mubarak? So this is the last chapter, but we are left with around uh, nine pages. Nine pages. Yeah. So essentially, within two, one session, we will be end. So next session could be the final session, or yes. shall I? Yeah, next session. The next will session will be the final session, then we will move to the Ihya. Yeah, yeah. Inshallah. Uh, I would like to ask the nationalities of the participants before we end, just for us to know which time zones you guys are at, because we want to create find the timing that is suiting for all of you, but particularly we need to be mindful of uh, Dr. Mubarak and also Sister Sema. So could you guys just write, okay, so we have UK, UK, all right. Please everybody write just which country. UK, three UK, so it's a lot of UK today here. India, India, Singapore, US. Any any more nationalities? Indonesia. Do we have anybody from Middle East, from uh, the Arab world or Iran or South Africa? Okay, perfect. Any other country? So we have Turkey. Fatima Mirza, if you can write which country. Habib Khan. Hassan. Khaled. Mohammed. All right, the US. Okay, mashallah. So US, so it's a very different time zones here. So yeah, we'll try to find the timing. I mean, weekend, weekdays is quite difficult because if we do a timing that is suitable for Dr. Mubarak, then it will be very early for you guys in the U.S. So khair, inshallah. We'll do our best to find a way that everybody can benefit. If not, you guys can always listen to the recordings. But to just be live at the halaqa is always more beneficial to meet your teacher and interact with your teacher is actually also, also the sunnah and the practice in Islamic thought. Well, we'll get back to you guys, inshallah. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Mubarak, for giving out of your precious time and allowing us to learn from your vast amount of knowledge. Thank you so much for Sister Sayra, Sister Yusra for reading in an excellent way. Thank you for Sister Sema for facilitating this halaqa as the project management of it. We really appreciate it. And thank you all, brothers and sisters, for joining us from a low the world. We're very honored to have you all with us. I wish you all a great continuation of the day, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Mubarak. We'll see each other next week, inshallah. Next yeah. month, inshallah. Yeah. Yeah. So brothers and sisters, we will share the chapters to read to next time in the WhatsApp group. And Sister Sema will share it in the WhatsApp group and also through email, inshallah. Take care of yourself. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Yeah, Extend yeah. our greetings to your family. It's an honor to have you all with us. Sister Sema, with your permission, I will end the session now. Jazakallah khairan, Sister Sema. As always, you're doing an amazing job, sister. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.